hello. Uh, so uh, today we are going to talk about uh, storage as new chapter. So far we uh, talk about the expressions, types and values. Uh, and today uh, we are going to talk about how data is stored in uh, programming language and computer's memory. Uh, so, uh, the concept of variable, I believe you are all uh, familiar with that. Uh, we have a major uh, distinction uh, between the functional languages and the imp imperative languages. In functional languages, the variables are like math variables. They are defined, they get some value, and it never changes. Uh, during the lifetime of the variable, it remains the same. So the variable either is not bound yet, the lifetime is not started yet, or uh, it remain, it is set to some value, that means it is a final value. Uh, however, in the imperative languages, uh, the variable is like a data container. So it changes, it has uh, some notion of state. So a variable is something that changes state that you can inspect and update uh, depending on your algorithm. Uh, in a variable, we have two basic operations, inspecting its value and updating them. Uh, most of the programming languages, you don't have uh, uh, these two operations explicit, explicit like function calls, uh, but actually they correspond to two different operations. Uh, the lifetime of the time of a variable uh, starts uh, when uh, the uh, enclosing body defines it and uh, at the beginning it is in state of unallocated so it does not exist the, your computer's memory is just a large chunk of memory when a program uh, starts uh, there is no variable so as soon as it starts executing uh, some of the variables especially in the global scope are created then after them, uh, depending on the functions and the codes that you are executing, a variable is uh, put into this allocated state. Uh, but we have uh, one uh, special case where uh, the variable doesn't have to have some uh, useful information. And this stage we calling an undefined state. So uh, it is allocated, the memory belongs to the programming language and it is usable, but if you inspect that value, you wouldn't get anything useful. Uh, probably it will be a random value. In the global variables, uh, the state does not exist uh, because as soon as it's allocated, it is initialized. Uh, but uh, in uh, local variables, this exists. Uh, there is uh, some gap between initialization and allocation, and you don't have to initialize it at all. Uh, so it, this state uh, will exist for the local variables. And this is that state, so x is defined, but it doesn't carry any information. Then it will be, uh, the variable will be in a storable state. That means it has a value. So you can have both operations, well, it's inspection and uh, update and the uh, undefined state, you can only uh, update it. You can, of course, inspect it, but you won't get anything useful. Then, when the uh, scope is over, like in this local uh, case here, when this function returns, uh, it will be deallocated, so it will be given back to the operating system. So, this is uh, the basic lifetime of a variable. Uh, during the lifetime of the variable, we can uh, update and inspect the variables uh, depending on uh, the variable type. If it is a primitive value, we basically update and uh, inspect it in a, a simple way. But if it is a complex value, there are options depending on the programming languages. You can either selectively update it or uh, totally update it. So in this uh, structure, C structure, for example, you can either assign it 
as a whole, pass as a parameter, etc. So it will behave like a single unit of data, even though it may be large, like one kilobyte, two kilobytes. Uh, you can assign it as a, with a single statement, or you can selectively update it. Depending on the programming languages, uh, language, uh, it may uh, support one or both of the methods. For example, in uh, C, as you know, total update of arrays do not exist. So this will not work. You can only selectively update variables of C. Um, and this comes with this total versus selective update comes with this uh, nested operation. So uh, the field of a structure can be another structure and so on. So this uh, some update can be uh, selective for the outer structure, but for the inner structure, it may be uh, a total uh, update. Uh, so at this moment, actually, we are going to talk about the arrays, array variables. And uh, because they may uh, have uh, very significant, very important significant property, depending on the programming language design. Uh, the programming language may choose one of those three options, either static arrays, which says at the compile time, the size of array is fixed and it never changes. And the second case, uh, the array size is fixed at runtime, but uh, when lifetime is started, uh, has been started, it doesn't does not change. And the third case, the array is, uh, array is flexible, so you can uh, shrink or grow the array in any way you like. The size uh, changes during the runtime. Uh, so in those uh, three options. You uh, know, uh, most uh, familiar example is C for static arrays. Uh, you fix the size of the array at compile time. So the size of arrays uh, should contain only uh, constants and expressions involving constants, constants, nothing else. So, so you cannot have any variable here. Uh, user defined input is out of question. So it is static. And it is fixed at compact time. On the other hand, uh, some extensions of uh, C, like uh, C90 version or uh, GCC, uh, we have this type of uh, dynamic arrays. So at runtime, depending on which value you are uh, passing to this function f, this array is allocated and it is uh, made available, okay? Uh, so this way, you don't have to use, for example, a fixed size structure in the function. So it is a quite powerful feature. Uh, this n comes, uh, can be determined at runtime, for example, user input, depending on user input, you call f, and at the end, you will have this dynamic array. It is quite productive, uh, but unfortunately, it is not in ANSI C. Uh, in C++, we have templates or uh, similar constructs to uh, provide that, but it is not internal. It is uh, defined as a library. Also, we have uh, the uh, STF, the vector uh, data type, uh, stands for a, a flexible array, actually not dynamic, even flexible array. Uh, in the flexible array case, uh, the array sizes complete the variable. So you can add new objects, remove objects out of the array, array grows and shrinks. Uh, and most familiar ex examples, example for you is, I believe, the Python lists. Actually, it is a class, but a built-in class. And you can push and pop and insert and delete to a Python array so that it can grow and shrink. I have uh, 
probably more interesting uh, example, which is uh, the Pearl example. And the Pearl, the uh, array size uh, dynamically grow uh, by assignments. In Python, you cannot assign. So if it is uh, current uh, size is 10, assigning 15 elements will give you an error. So you have to grow it by using this method. Uh, but in Python, it is not like that. So this is the size of your array, and it is going to give you two because, uh, because I have zero, one, two. So this is the largest number in Perl. Uh, and directly, you can assign 10 elements of the array. Uh, the, the array as whole is denoted as at symbol. Selective uh, update is denoted with dollar here. So here I, I update 10 elements. So then array size becomes 11 now. And then if I assign 20 element, array size becomes 21. And if you delete one element, this is something interesting. So Perl keeps that as one, three, five, undefined, 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 etc. up to 12, then many undefined, then 20. So when you delete this item, it will roll back to last defined element. So array size will become 10 again. So this is an interesting choice of uh, array implementation for uh, Perl. Uh, in Python, it is uh, different than this. And C++ uh, vectors uh, data type is implemented as class. It looks like Python implementation. Uh, so this is how it works. Again, it is about complexity of your programming language. Most programming languages have uh, class libraries, built-in class libraries uh, for implementation of flexible arrays. Uh, but uh, they are mostly object-oriented languages or script languages. Uh, the C, Pascal, Fortran uh, has this choice of uh, static arrays. In uh, Fortran, I believe there is uh, flexible arrays, but uh, for Pascal and C, we have uh, static arrays. So now, let us talk about the semantics of assignments. I believe uh, so far you uh, have learned two programming languages, Python and C in this department. Uh, so actually you know the examples of this uh, assignment by copy versus assignment for, uh, by reference, uh, or in, as the other terminology says, it is deep copy versus uh, shallow copy. Uh, so, the, in the copy case, actually it is a, a total copying of an item over the other one. So the storage of when you have this assignment, uh, X is assigned to Y. So this is our operation here. So when I make this assignment, storage of X is over here and storage of Y is over here. So all bytes are copied from one structure to the other. So it is one by, uh, by uh, at a time copying of all of the elements. So it is like something we call mem copy. So it looks like strcpy and so on. In the other end, on the other end, we have the uh, assignment by reference or shallow copy, you can call that. In that case, the assignments is working with the references. We are not going to call it pointers because pointers and references are slightly different. Uh, so language keeps references of variables. And when you make an uh, assignment, the references change. The bytes and the content does not change. And this is also true for parameter passing in this kind of languages. Parameter passing is like pass by reference. We are going to talk about that later. So the after assignment case, we will have this picture. The storage of value, value remains here, and the reference of X now 
refers to y object instead of its previous object. And what happens to all value of x? It is lost. So that object existing before the assignment now does not exist or exists. So we are going to talk about that later and we are going to call this garbage. So this, uh, both uh, operations have uh, advantages and disadvantages. Of course, this one has a major advantage, the assignment by reference, which is speed. So uh, the other one has to copy the bytes and it takes CPU time. And this one, it is just instant almost, it's because internally you are assigning pointers. Uh, however, we have this uh, integrity problems here. After this operation, updating X will update this one, updating Y will update this one. So inspect Y, inspect X, update Y, they all work in the same storage. And this is called uh, structure sh sharing also. Uh, and it may end up in some trolls for you. Uh, the Python, Java, uh, and most of the script languages uh, follow this assignment by reference. Uh, and languages like C uh, follows this copy uh, semantics, uh, although it is uh, costly. Uh, So uh, the, uh, if you like to have this share semantics in C, uh, you can use pointers, okay? Uh, and C++, uh, we have uh, pass by reference, but it, it works in a uh, similar way. Uh, in Java, we have uh, two cases. If data type is primitive, it is copy semantics. So there is no structure share. Uh, all other types that are objects are reference semantics. And this is also true for Python. And Python, we can try that if you like. So, so when you say this and this one, changing X to five, does not change why, because it is primitive. However, if it is a non-primitive data type, and if you say this one, and expecting why will change both of them, because they are sharing the same structure. And this is the uh, reference semantics. Uh, So going back to that, we have speed advantage, et cetera. And the second one is about this integrity. And sometimes you need this copy semantics. In that case, Java solution is to have a member function called copy so that the object can be copied with deep copy. Uh, the, uh, in Python, we have constructors in order to copy the values. Uh, so, uh, so you need to have uh, a garbage collector. So this is another thing we are going to mention later. Since uh, lifetime of one object is over, the second one took care of that. Or in case of uh, such problems, the old value of X, uh, someone should take care of that memory and claim its memory uh, so that programming can, language can use it. Uh, so this is one of the uh, most important uh, topics of this uh, chapter, actually, which is lifetime. So lifetime uh, depends on programming language and where your uh, variable is uh, defined. And lifetime is just uh, the, the period between the allocation of the variable and the allocation of the variable. Uh, so between them, the variable is useful, so you can uh, inspect and update uh, the variable. Be before that, it does not exist. After that, it does not exist. Uh, there are four types of uh, lifetimes. Uh, use observe uh, first three in a typical programming language. Fourth one is like a library and operating system interaction. So it does not exist natively in the uh, 
uh, programming languages. And the global lifetime, uh, the lifetime is the whole program. As long as your program works in some sort of process, the variables is alive. And the local lifetime, the lifetime is depending on the enclosing block, a function or enclosing block. And the heap lifetime, the lifetime is arbitrary. User controls that. So, so user creates the variable and the allocates the variable. At some instance of your program, it starts at some instance, regardless of how many blocks are uh, entered and exit, the heap variable exists. So global lifetime is something easy. Uh, you know global variables, what a global, global variable is. So uh, the global variables have uh, global lifetime. That means when operating system starts your program and execution uh, started as the first instruction is executed, the lifetime, is, uh, say the lifetime starts and global variables are over there. So your very first instruction can use the global variable. Uh, and you can consider that, so actually we don't see that difference, but you can assume that even before main function, the global lifetime starts. So here uh, at this time chart, at some point, main starts for a C function and it exits. So even though you uh, the main exits, even though you cannot access the global variable here and here because you are not executing any code, it is over there. So global lifetime is slightly uh, larger than uh, the lifetime of the main function. At least we are going to consider that this way. Uh, now we have this interesting feature in C, not in many programming languages, but in C we have this static variables. Uh, so I mean a local variable like this that I call static. So this static keywords uh, make this uh, variable survive after F returns. And the next call to F, it will continue its state from where it is left. So in this way, you can, have, for example, have a counter each time you call F, you can increment A, for example, to count how many times F is uh, called. So this uh, has an interesting implementation. So you can call F many times in your code. So these uh, down arrows are call, uh, calls. Uh, the up arrows are return. So I call it and it returns. It is like that, like that. And this is my lifetime of my program. So lifetime of uh, a static variable has to start uh, at this point as last. So this is the last point it can start of lifetime. Actually, you can start it earlier, but this is the last point. When I am going to terminate that, so I have to terminate that here, which is the last call last call to function f. But the question is, do I know it? Do I know which f call is the last call? After returning from this, I won't call it again. Can anyone tell me about, can anyone tell me that this was the last call so you can delegate it? And actually, since this is not defined, so you cannot determine this, you have to make it like that. So the, uh, the lifetime, such a lifetime is actually defined as the global lifetime. So it is like global lifetime in a 
function scope. What is a function scope? Those curly braces. So that variable can be accessed in between those curly braces only, not everywhere else. But the variable is alive. So this is something interesting. At some instance of your code, the variable is inaccessible, but alive. So this is the case. Uh, so static variables of C are variables with global lifetime in a function or in a local scope. Scope is our next chapter. So in the next chapter, we will talk about binding and scope. And uh, so these are two different things, the scope and the lifetime. Lifetime is about storage, scope is about accessibility and visibility of a variable. And this variable is visible only inside of the function, but alive otherwise. So the next lifetime is the local lifetime. All local variables have this local lifetime. Uh, depending on programming language, uh, the uh, declaring local variable, declaring scope can be a function or a class, or it can be a, a arbitrary uh, local block. So it can be a different place. So it can be a class. So that's, that might be some local variables inside of the class. I'm not talking about members, but the local variables. Uh, or it can be a, a function, which is, or it can be arbitrary, like it is in C. For example, in a for loop, you can define a local variable. In arbitrary uh, blocks of C, you can define local variables. Uh, also, parameters. are local variables as well. So they have the local scope. The scope, uh, the lifetime of a local variable is actually uh, the period between the function call and function return. So it starts as soon as the function enters and it finishes when function returns at some arbitrary point. Uh, So uh, also the local uh, parameters are local variables uh, and local variables have an important uh, feature, which is uh, if your function is recursive, mutually or directly recursive, uh, the local variable have more than one instance at each activation record of the recursive function, you will have another copy of the local variable. Uh, so this is some, picture of a lifetime. So we show lifetime like that. Uh, so the global lifetime is here and between main call and exit, we have all of the main local variables, F, then G, then H, H is a recursive function and so on. So that means at this instance, for example, at exactly this instant, the variables of G, locals of G, locals of F, locals of main and global variables are alive. At this instance, there is no variable of G and F alive, but two copies of H local variables and main and global are alive. So in this way, we can define uh, arbitrary uh, local variables. So they, they created, uh, destroyed, created, destroyed, destroyed and it is controlled by function calls. So this is an example code. Uh, in this one, we have a global uh, variable X, which has this global scope. We have uh, the main local, which is K. In this case, it starts at main invocation and it finishes at main return. Uh, the main cause F, so the uh, lifetime of local variables depends on runtime, if a function is called or not. Uh, so it is determined at runtime. So F has a double variable Z, so in the F invocation. So during this period, so F 
call and return, Z is alive, but F calls G so that G's local variables, X and Y are alive here. So B and X destroyed, Z destroyed, and now I am in the main. I call H with one, H has a local variable and a parameter, and an A, and the first invocation, I have a copy, but it invokes H again. So I have another copy. This one will be called with uh, parameter zero. So it is going to return. It doesn't make a further uh, recursive call. So as a result, we'll have inner H returns, H returns, then main returns, and then global variables. So these are the uh, lifetime of variables uh, in local and global scope. We have a more interesting uh, lifetime, which is the heap variables. Heap variables are uh, allocated on demand by the user, or internally they can be allocated as well. For example, in Java, there are many heap variables uh, allocating, but you are not aware of that. So any uh, object you create is actually a heap variable. Uh, so any constructor call ends up in a heap variable, but you are not uh, aware of that because it is not a pointer. In C, it is explicit because you see that it's a pointer. Uh, but in Java and Python, there are many heap variables. Almost all of the complex uh, data structures are uh, complex objects uh, are uh, heap variables. Uh, and they are created on demand from the user and they are deallocated when the lifetime is over. In C and C++, uh, we have some unique feature. We have the control of the heap variable. So we deallocate the heap variable. In Java, Python, you don't see this deallocation. You don't have a free because of garbage collector. But in C and C++, the user has the control. And the heap variables are arbitrary. That means the lifetime is completely uh, controlled by the user. Anywhere this code is executed, the lifetime starts. And anywhere this code is executed, lifetime is over. And it may span multiple uh, invocation of functions. One function may allocate, the other one may deallocate, and so on. And the picture uh, will be just spanning many function calls. Uh, in this special C case, uh, I would like to emphasize this terminology difference. So the P and star P are two different variables. So in C, we have a storage for P, and that storage points to somewhere else, which has its content, 3.4. And this is what we are going to call star P. P is either a global, global or local variables, star P is a heap variable. So this is the difference. Star P, so in this course, we are going to denote like that. Star P will be heap variable, and the other one will be local or global variable. So this is our uh, example. So we will have F, F calls G, and G allocates uh, some heap variable. Uh, P has this global scope. And at this point, inside of G, heap variable is created. And then G returns, F returns, main calls H, H returns. And inside of main, at this arbitrary point, it is deallocated. And the lifetime of our if variable will span like that. Uh, so uh, as an example, I can uh, show you the lifetime in a C++ example. So let me just give you that example. So our code is this one. So in order to uh, take advantage of uh, computer-generated lifetime, 
I had this uh, struct int here, uh, which has uh, which will show me the start of lifetime and end of lifetime lifetime thanks to this constructor and destructors. Uh, the uh, I have a global variable x. I have a global pointer variable p. I have two local variables a and c, local variable, and this is the start of the heap variable. So this is how you start the heap variable star p. F calls g, g creates the heap variable, then I call h, h returns, and so on, and then I delete p. So it's pretty much similar to example on the slides. So now let us uh, try to correspond them in the output. So this is my output. So this global variable X is over there and you can see its lifetime, which is the whole program. Uh, then uh, I don't show this, but this is X, X and actually also P has such a lifetime. P is not visible here because it is not an object. Uh, the pointers are not objects, they are pointers to object. Um, then I have uh, the zero is created. So actually here at this moment, the main function is called. And all locals of main are created and destroyed here in the scope. So this zero is actually corresponding to this T here, and so this one as well, okay? Uh, so after that, F is called. F has the Z, so this 10 is Z. Actually, I had better uh, mark them with naming them, so this is x, x, this is t, this is t, this is x, x, and the 10 is for z, and this is the start of f, and uh, start of uh, f lifetime, then g is called, and g generates the w, w is 20. Then this is the start of the heap variable, which is star p. Uh, star p goes like that until it hits here. So this is a heap lifetime. Now this is end of 20. So this is the lifetime for w. This is 10. This is lifetime or z. And then the lifetime of 30 starts, which is, which is C. So this is H call, a different call. And it is over just in the next line here, output. Then I have uh, here at this moment, I have another lifetime which is not visible because this is not only C, but also A. So A is initialized by from T. So T has zero value, so zero here. So this 30 and zero are. So lifetime of A is not marked here because of this constructor, it's not copy constructor, but the idea is this is lifetime of two variables, which is H. And zero is for A here. Then within main, we have lifetime of heap variable and it will go uh, like that. So it is pretty much similar to our uh, slides, okay? So this is the idea, lifetime of heap variables can start at arbitrary location at any moment. They can start and uh, they survive until uh, explicitly uh, being uh, delocated. This comes with, of course, a serious problem. 
since you give uh, this power to the user, uh, allocation and deallocation of uh, heap variables, you may end up in a situation that uh, you try to access a variable, you try to refer a variable whose lifetime is over. So look at this example. So this P, Q, lifetime of heap variable P started, I assign Q to P. This is a pointer assignment. So Q and P and are now sharing the same structure. Then you free Q. That means you deallocated this heap variable. Lifetime of heap variable is over, but still you have an access to that. Actually, there are two variables accessing uh, still uh, invalid area, which is deallocated. And now I, as soon as I try to access that location, it is an invalid reference and it is called a dangling reference. You try to access dangling reference is uh, at the moment you access it, uh, uh, you are accessing a deallocated lifetime over heap variable. And this is a more crucial example. Uh, this is a local variable re returning this local variable a, okay? So when this local, uh, the function call is over, the lifetime of a is over. And if you try to get that uh, value and try to print, for example, uh, you are accessing something that does not exist anymore and you are going to get probably an error. Uh, so both of them are examples of dangling reference. You can come up with other uh, examples of dangling references as well. Sometimes operating system tolerates this, those dangling references and you may have an illusion that you are making a valid access, but this is not true. Uh, because that toler uh, toleration is about the operating system, it doesn't mean your program is working properly. Uh, if you keep continuing uh, uh, dangling references, at the end, you will have this errors, protection fault and segmentation fault. And believe me, this is the worst case because the point you are taking the segmentation fault is much more later than the actual point of the angling references. This may happen, especially buffer of all flows, the underflows work that way. So let me show you an example of the angling reference. Actually, it is uh, the same code. So this is my code. And when I execute this code, I get a segmentation fault. Uh, <clears throat> where do I uh, get it? Actually, I don't get it here, but this is the point. So this is the more crucial one, and this one gets a core dump. Uh, because uh, the even the compiler warns me about that. Uh, So compiler tells me function returns are just of local variables. So uh, the compiler warns me. If you like to see uh, dangling reference and garbages, there is a uh, very useful tool, which is Walgrind. It is ex actually a virtual CPU executing your code in a safer environment. And it is going to warn you about those. Okay. Okay, so it says that, for example, uh, email three dot size one at twentieth line. So it says this one is a dangling reference email three. Uh, so it says that the address is zero bytes inside of a block of size ten freed here. So you are accessing something that you free here. So it is giving you all of those information. And you allocated that in 14, they allocated 18, and you are accessing at 20. 20 is the position of the ending reference. Uh, the next one is much more harder to read, actually, uh, because <clears throat> uh, it says this one. Because uh, the 
compiler makes some uh, security protection and it returns zero instead of A. It doesn't return the actual value of A, but zero. That's why you get this error, but it is another uh, point of segmentation, uh, sorry, uh, dangling reference. And now operating system does not tolerate you anymore because it is zero, so it is a segmentation fault. Uh, we have a, like a, a brother of dangling reference or like mirror symmetry of dangling reference. In dangling reference, we have uh, a variable exists, but it does not exist. In a garbage, it is the reverse. The variable exists, but you cannot uh, access it anymore. So you lo lose access to a variable which uh, has still lifetime continuing. So it is an example. For example, you allocated the heap variable and you overridden the last known pointer or last known reference of that heap variable with something else. So you lost it. Uh, in the second case, in the local variable, you allocated it and you return it. Since the uh, only reference to that heap variable, which is P, is a local variable and lifetime is over, now you don't have any access to this uh, heap variable anymore. Again, you can create many examples of garbage. Garbage is not destructive like uh, dangling reference. You won't get any uh, segmentation fault, but it uses your memory constantly. If it is a simple homework or a simple 10 lines of code that is going to finish in uh, five microseconds, it doesn't worth considering probably. But uh, as computer engineers, we program uh, long living systems like 24 hours, seven days. Uh, some software work for years without maintenance and they are trying to have that such software which does not require maintenance and when software is alive, is it possible to patch the software? Is it possible to patch an operating system when it is alive? So that means uh, if you have a garbage byte once in a second, in 10 years, that bytes can be large. Or uh, in a web server getting 10,000 connections per second, if you spend 100 bytes, it will be 1 million bytes per second, one megabyte per second. And after a couple of days, your terabyte, not terabyte, but almost a terabyte memory will just finish and your process will get an error. So uh, we don't uh, like garbage. We don't like programs with garbage because long-lasting programs will uh, finish your computer's memory. And this is sometimes called memory leakage. You have heard about this as well. And let me show you the examples of garbage here. And this is my example. And again, if you execute that, nothing happens. This program doesn't have an output. Uh, and you will not see anything, but your program at some point at this garbage. And this is the summary of Walgreens output. It says definitely lost 30 bytes in two blocks. If you give leak check full, it will give you uh, more information. Uh, 10 bytes in one blocks are definitely loss. And this is the position you allocate that, the 12th one. Uh, it has a garbage. And the second one is allocated here in fifth line called from this one. So it informs you about that. Uh, the garbage is a uh, serious problem for C, C++ programmers. Uh, but in other languages like Java, Python, we don't have that, even though we are using heap variables a lot. 
Uh, also in Haskell, you are using heap variables a lot without knowing because the internal structures uh, are implemented in heap like a list and so on. Uh, so you don't observe it because the automatic uh, operation uh, that collects garbage and claims its memory exists and we call it a uh, garbage collection. So what uh, simply a garbage collector does is this one. It, will, it is going to keep a reference counter on each uh, reference. For example, you created hello. And then you say x is y. Now, hello is a heap variable with its reference to one. After assignment, the number of ref references will be two. And then you pass that to a function. And function body has another reference. And in the function, after it is used, the function returns. So since a reference to x is lost, it is decremented again. Then uh, you say y is 0. It is decremented again. Then uh, somehow you overwrite value of x with, x with something else, it is decremented again. Now it is zero. Zero means no one can access this hello anymore. So that means it becomes a uh, garbage. Since number of references is zero, in the future, no one can refer as well. There is no way accessing that variable anymore. So now we can claim this memory. And this is how garbage collector works. Uh, but there are wiser algorithms. So some languages use garbage collection without reference count and so on. Uh, it depends on the implementation. But this is most uh, typical implementation. Uh, one. Important problem is the execution of garbage collector. So garbage collector is working on the data structure of heap and they are locating garbage, traversing all of the uh, garbage structures in cases you have uh, nested composite values. So this is one of the uh, non-trivial cases. So your uh, structure contains reference to other structures that and contains reference to arrays and so on. Uh, in that case, it is more complex operation. So the collecting garbage may take more time. Uh, so it is not immediate. So you don't collect garbage as soon as it is zero because it will uh, decrease the performance of your program. So it is a garbage, uh, it's a number crunching operation and it needs speed for execution. And in the middle, your program stops uh, garbage, 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 and then continues. So this is not a good practice. Instead of that, uh, most of the most programming languages have this garbage collecting threads, and they are scheduled with some intervals. So instead of having a one million invocation of one million garbage variables, uh, once in a while, it wakes up, collects most of the garbage, and goes back. That is like the same thing in our life. We don't throw each piece of paper directly to the container outside of the building. We just put it somewhere and then we uh, bring them to the uh, container. It's just something like that. Uh, we have very restrictive solution alternative to garbage. So we don't give references uh, that are assigned to a longer lifetime variable. So never allow a local variable to assign to a global variable or a global variable reference, uh, so not global, uh, heap, heap variable assigned to a short uh, lifetime variable and so on. But this is a pretty much a non-useful case. Uh, our next lifetime, which doesn't have much example, is the persistent lifetime. And the question is this one. Is it possible to have the variable value 
after program exits. So program terminates, but I like my variable to be alive. It cannot be in memory, so where it uh, can uh, happen, it can happen on hard disk or secondary storage or in a remote computer. So in that case, I can store that information temporarily until I wake up again, I get the uh, variable value and continue in memory. Uh, this is what we call sometimes a database, sometimes a file and so on. And in most of the cases, this uh, lifetime is achieved through uh, library calls. So instead of directly manipulating variables, we write it on hard disk and read it, uh, or we send it over network and take it back. Uh, in object-oriented languages, we have serialization. It is called serialization. Uh, converting object into a binary string and then load it. In Python, for example, we have something we call pickle. So this pickle library gets any object and converts into a string. Then you can write that string on hard disk. So this is an ugly hard disk. And then you can take it back as a string, not string, but bytes actually. Then you say pickle loads and voila your object is alive again. So it works this way. And this is called serialization. Uh, so in this way, we can take snapshot of objects. They can save them, restore them, and uh, you can store them over network, send it to another machine, and your code resume from there. So we have such scenarios uh, possible. Uh, but uh, native support of persistent variables uh, is not popular. There are a couple of experimental programming languages. Uh, I used to observe one called C star star. Actually, it was in Matthew, uh, but it is not uh, typical. Uh, so uh, our next question is about the uh, management of memory. Uh, Okay, uh, now uh, the problem here is uh, the uh, actual implementation of the storage, how computers uh, interact with the operating system to uh, make this possible. Uh, first of all, um, there is a, a generic uh, uh, picture of each uh, process, each program in the computer's memory. Memory, and this is uh, due to due to uh, the nature and the format of the uh, binary executable operating system, uh, virtual memory, and so on. So, uh, it is quite tightly coupled with the operating system uh, linker loaders and uh, other system uh, utilities uh, loading the program. So the operating system divides uh, the memory of uh, a program into these uh, parts. Actually, they are sections. So these sections uh, are independent from each other. For example, executable code is in some area of memory. The global variables are in an area. The stack is in an area. And if variables are in an area. In this way, uh, the memory management will be easier and isolated. And also you can have protections, for example, code section cannot be written and so on. Uh, when a, a computer program, so it is actually a binary, uh, in Linux it is called F binary format, in Windows it is PXE, uh, and you may come up with other formats if you like. Uh, the program uh, is, uh, stored as the executable instructions plus some metadata. And when your program is loaded into computer's memory, actually virtual memory of a process in a typical operating system, those sections are filled with actual data, okay? So there are sections here 
and these sections are loaded in their counterparts. So for this course, you need to know how global variables, local variables, and heap variables are matched. And the, um, uh, the case is the global variables are uh, created on this loading time. So the binary loaded in the process memory, uh, the variables are created. Then there is some main here and the execution jumps to that point. So the global variables are over there, then main is executed. So this is the idea. Uh, the heap variables on the other hand uh, are in a section and they are actually uh, in a complicated data structure because the memory manager uh, allocates dynamic storage, they allocate, allocate, they allocate, and uh, you may have 1,000 allocations and 500 day allocations, and it should maintain the computer's memory uh, as accessible as possible, so you wouldn't have problems like fragmentation. So, uh, so this is some complicated task, and uh, this complicated task is handled by what we call libc, uh, the basic uh, C library provided this. Uh, data structures and operating system will back this process, giving large chunks of memory to the process. But the idea is uh, the heap can grow and shrink, and this heap section also can grow and shrink as well. Uh, the other thing, uh, the next thing is the stack, and I'm going to mention that. But before that, I would like to show you the picture of a program yeah. demonstration. Okay. So this is actually a simple program, but I'm making a trick. And that trick is you don't need to understand, but calling this PMAP utility in Linux to get this picture of the program. Uh, I uh, compile my codes as static, just to make this picture uh, simpler. So after this compilation, it will give me this picture. So this picture uh, tells me about the locations of these areas, the sections. And if you look uh, here, uh, also actually I need to show you my source code so that you can compare that. In this uh, source code, I have two functions, f and r. I have uh, eight uh, kilobytes global variable. I have some short, shorter uh, global variable. And I believe that's it. There is no other uh, global variable here. And what I do is I eventually print some of the variables here, I call functions and print some areas. So now let us uh, look into this uh, correspondence. The thing is uh, Z and T are global variables. And when I'm reporting uh, here in this two functions, uh, a, C, D are local variables in both of them. So both of them has the same. Uh, the exception is this C here is marked as static. So R, C is actually static as we mentioned, it should be in global scope. Now let us look into uh, this output and try to check if things are okay. Uh, so, as I said, the Z and T are glo uh, global variables. And if you look into this picture, you will see that for, there are two areas, 4A, 3000, and 4A, 9000. And if you see here, 4A, nine, blah, blah, and this one is six, blah, blah. Okay, so this tells me that T is 
here and z is here. Okay. The difference is one of them is uninitialized, the other is initialized. This uh, initialized section is uh, related to the uh, binary, so it is in a different section because this information one, two, three, four is coming from that binary. Uh, the other one is just uninitialized, so it has just uh, simply uh, anonymous, it is called anonymous area. So this is my global variable. So these two are my global sections, initialized versus uninitialized. Then if you uh, look into um, uh, others, for example, in F, you see this one, this one, and this one. And in R, we have one difference. We have one difference. This is the difference. Uh, since the C is static, this one is uh, coming from actually also in this static section. Okay, not the anonymous, but static. I, I don't know. It is probably an implementation detail. But the idea is it is in the global scope. This is the important point I would like to make. Uh, the others, the locals, are coming from uh, around this. Uh, 7FF DF54, 7FF DF54, blah, blah. Okay, so CB starts at CB. And this is the stack. <coughs> Sorry about that. Uh, the, so the local variables, all of them, including parameters, are coming from this, what we call stack. I'm going to explain that in a moment. And then let us look at our heap. So we have this heap variable here. I need to show that from the source codes. So at the bottom in the main, uh, I allocate uh, three regions of half a kilobyte and P array is going to store them. So the P is on stack, it is a local variable, but the heap variable search at this DEA 090, DEA 2A0, DEA 4B0. So these are the mallocs, mallocs returns them. And if you look into this picture, you will say, see uh, DE 8000 to 140 kilobyte contains this. And this is another anonymous region, but this anonymous region is not global region. It is what we call a heap section. The uh, positioning of uh, heap section and the uh, stack section is chosen, chosen uh, specifically because as you can see, we have a large area here. So we have a large gap here. The reason is this heap section will grow like that, smaller addre um, address to larger address, and stack will grow upwards from larger values to smaller values. So that as your program gets more and more uh, heap variables, this section will grow downwards this section, sorry, shortening the gap. And as you push new activation records, that means you have some uh, very nested recursive calls, thousands of millions of them, the stack will grow upwards. So, so this is the uh, picture of this uh, event in uh, operating systems uh, point of view. Okay. Now let's just go back to our slides. Okay. So the blurry point here, so heap is in data structures, globals are loaded at uh, program load time. The blurry area is local variables. 
actually you can handle uh, some of the local variables uh, as uh, with heap as well. So heap is a choice for local variables. But on entry, you need to allocate, and on exit, on return, in any kind of return, you need to deallocate. And most of the heap variable allocation uh, routines are also functions. So in order to enter a function, you call another function, which doesn't, which has some uh, problems. So we need at least uh, one alternative for, uh, for minimum uh, case for uh, only references and pointers. We need some other area. Uh, the important requirement for a local variable is you cannot have a single instance of a local variable. For example, in uh, f function, in the ex uh, previous example, you can say that fd is a variable and I am keeping that in the global uh, area. If you make sure that this function is, is going to be activated only once. So if your uh, programming language does not support recursion and your functions are not re-entered, that means only one copy will be active. Like our static local variables, uh, we can use global area as well. However, this is not the case. Most languages use recursion, especially functional languages use it a lot. Uh, so we need same uh, variable instantiated as you call the function again, 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 and again. Uh, so uh, there may be, uh, so all of them are alive at the same time. So you cannot just uh, temper the same and so on. Uh, so the solution is called the runtime stack. In the runtime stack, uh, we uh, actually keep uh, the return points. So for example, when uh, you call a function, you are jumping an arbitrary area in the code. When you return, uh, when you make the return statement, you have to go back to where you call your function. So actually, this is a requirement without local variables. So your execution goes here and calls f. And this means the execution is going to jump somewhere, start off f. It is going to continue until the return statement. How I am going to know this return? The return is going to go back to this point. But if I call it here, this return should go to this point. So uh, I need a mechanism. Depending on the call point, your function should jump back to the original point. Uh, storing some temporary area, et cetera, is not feasible because we have, um, at any instance of time, many functions are active. So just a singular reg register or some uh, temporary area is not sufficient. All functions return to some previous store position. So what they came up with is very simple idea, putting a stack. So this return uh, addresses are pushed here. So main f g each function pushes this return address here. And then when I have a return statement, I am going to pop some address A and I am going to jump to address A, simply. And when I'm calling F, I am going to push current address and I am going to jump F, okay? And this way, the stack, runtime stack works without any problem. And I can push this a little bit forward. And instead of uh, saving on the return value on stack, I can also save uh, other information like return address, return value, and parameters. So I need a mechanism to pass parameters as well. And also why not local variables? And this is the idea. This is how local variables are handled. So the uh, activation records, which is created 
when you call a function and which is deleted when you go out of the function or return from the function. Contains this return address, parameter values, uh, a reserved area for local variables. So you can create that after entering the function as well. So the local variables position. You, so your stack will advance in size of this activation record at each time you call a function f. Uh, and also return value can be stored here as well. If your return value is complex, the return value can be uh, stored here uh, as well when uh, you exit. So it will look like this. So this function, if you trace down calls g, g calls f, and f does something, goes back, goes back, and so on. So if you look at the activation records, first activation record is the main. So it is executed by the operating system. And main contains the local variables. The return uh, address is usually program exit code. So it, it is going to clean up and terminate the program. So there's such a, a small area of code to eat that. Uh, then each time a function is called, uh, the parameters of G are pushed, like four here is pushed. Then the return address, which is exactly this point, the 14th line in machine instruction, actually 15th line, okay, the next instruction is pushed. And then after entering, I have two integers here. So I push those uh, addresses. In the slides, I believe there is a confusion there. Uh, there's TMP and P, so that should be here. None is not correct. So actually it is TMP and P are local variables. Uh, then G calls F, that means it is going to push this parameters here to the activation record. And then it is going to push the return address, which will be next line from nine, next instruction from line nine. And then in F, I, I need, for example, 10 bytes here. So I have this bytes. So the picture of activation record is we have a base pointer. So this base pointer is created by the caller function uh, with return address and the parameters. Uh, and sometimes this return address is below the uh, parameters, depending on architecture. So it is, we use architecture-based uh, Intel, for example, has some architecture, ARMs, maybe another architecture. Uh, so depending on that, it should be top or it can be bottom. Uh, so then, we have also programming languages choose different uh, approaches. Uh, then we have the stack pointer, the actual uh, position of the stack is over there. So the next function call will be on top of that, on top of that. And if you have recursion, it will go like that and no local variable will inter uh, overwrite another. So everything will be isolated on stack. Uh, the, uh, so the function call, so if you are writing the instructions of this G, they refer to the uh, base pointer minus four, base pointer minus eight, and so on. So all variables are relative to base pointer or stack pointers. Uh, these are registers. Uh, there are two registers and uh, actually stack pointer is sufficient, but you can also use base pointer uh, for making your life easier. So for example, when it updates TMP or says TMP, TMP is something like uh, in the G base pointer minus something. Okay. So in this way, we will have all local variables are resolved and they are accessed uh, in their corresponding 
uh, codes. So the function calls are fixed. Uh, they are just referring to that. So if function call is on the caller side, pushing parameters, uh, by the way, this is optional because in uh, contemporary architectures, we have plenty of registers and most of the parameters we pass are uh, simple parameters like integers or doubles. Uh, so if they fit into a register, simply registers can be used for this purpose. Okay. Uh, but there are local variables created. The local variables are initialized from the registers. So the caller side, they are just setting some integers and uh, the function side will move them to the actual places. Uh, but in the worst case, for example, if you have a large structure, 100 bytes and so on, it is uh, pushed by the caller. Uh, they push return address and jump to a function called start. Usually this is a, sing a single CPU instruction like call Q in Intel. Uh, so it calls Q at address. So that address is jumped. Q stands for four bytes address. If it is larger, there is another instruction. So the idea is push the parameters and jump. Then when function uh, is entered, function knows the size of its locals. It gets that information and adjusts this activation records. So it will set a base pointer to current stack pointer and advances stack pointer so that it is going to be ready for probable uh, next jump or next function call. So it will advance stack pointer to its final position during this uh, function execution. Uh, then function body will, uh, body will access all local variables relative to their base pointer and the function return it is going to uh, set stack pointer to base pointer position and pop the return address and jump the return address and color uh, side will recover the stack pointer and use the return value if exists uh, but you should know that uh, also, return value is usually simple, and most of the cases, integers, doubles, etc., the simple registers like EAX can be used. So you don't need stack for this purpose. So the local variables are handled this way, uh, and if it is uh, recursive, you will see a similar picture. Each recursion will create a new activation record, and since the same code is executed for H, looking relative uh, variables to base pointer will go in this area or this area, depending on, on which activation record you are currently. So at this moment, going base pointer minus something is going to give you TMP. And this one, base pointer minus something is going to give TMP. So both codes, same code, accesses different variables depending on the activation record. And this is the beauty of uh, local variables. Uh, the, uh, depending on the language we have, uh, the references are used on the uh, stack uh, and maybe the actual objects, they refer the, the references. Uh, refer to our own heap, or in languages like C, it is just simply uh, everything declared and allocated on stack. Uh, so, uh, so as I said, order of values in the activation record may differ depending on programming language. And uh, in order to accelerate the process, registers are used uh, uh, most of the case uh, for parameter passing. But after being passed, the parameter should be on local uh, storage, so it should be on stack as well. Uh, so the... Uh, in garbage collection, collecting languages like Java, Python, uh, the references are on the stack and the actual objects may be on the heap 
because they may be referred by uh, multiple uh, variables. Uh, the things get more, much more complicated. For example, in Python, you can do this. So it is just uh, initiate uh, your thinking about this topic. Uh, I'm not going to give much details and I'm not expecting you to uh, know a solution, you, you to come up with a solution to this. For example, this is multiplier A and inside of that, I declared another function and it returns f the local variable local uh, function referring a okay so multiplier a returns a function and that function multiplies something with a then i say twice is multiplier of two then i can use twice as an ordinary function so this is closure this uh, gets much more complicated because in the uh, activation uh, record you have a function and a new function is created in terms of this a and when you call twice that function which looks like a local variable variable of multiplier is being used so these are uh, more complicated mechanism uh, again it's just to start uh, your thinking about the thing let me look at if I have an example of this. Uh, I actually, you don't know much about this uh, assembler language, but I can give you some what's going on. So this is. This is a program. This is actually an advanced test, so I'm not going to uh, talk too much about that. But I'm going to just show you uh, this uh, functions. For example, this is G inside of G. So this is like saving base pointer and setting stack pointer to base pointer. Uh, and uh, these are uh, our actual uh, variables, for example, uh, multiplying. So this is G code, so that should be thumbs. Uh, by the way, if you like to get this, you need to call uh, GCC with this minus capital S option so that. Sorry. And then this one, you will see uh, after printf, we have. So this is multiplication of the value, and the value comes from this. So you don't have to read this, but the idea is base pointer minus 20 is x. Okay. So let us look into a. I believe it is. This is x, and the a should be uh, passed to this printf function. So it is okay. I believe it is this one. Okay, this one. This one is uh, a. If you look into f. Here I have I and S and A. So these are some of the variables here. Also, we have this uh, further local scopes here, like this one. So this TMP is created in size of A and depending on the value passed uh, at runtime, it is going to calculate that. So this uh, requires further uh, mechanisms to push new values on stack. So it is modifying stack and so on. So this is the idea, the code, that this is what you need uh, to know. The code is relative to registers so that local variables can be found in the uh, assembler code. 
probably you will enjoy this uh, in uh, your uh, computer organization courses. Uh, okay, now, so we have finished with uh, variables lifetime. Uh, in this uh, part, I would like to mention about uh, the generic uh, programming languages, uh, code segments, they modify variables. So if a code segment has a value, so when you evaluate it, you will end up in some getting some value, it is called an expression. However, if it does not create, uh, if it does not return a value, but has some effect on the variables or the state of the program, it is called a comment. Uh, so we are going to talk about them. I'm, I would like to go fast over there uh, because you know these things if you already know C. Uh, so the assignment is one important uh, type of statement. We have a left-hand side. It needs to be an L value, meaning it is. it needs to be a reference to a variable, not the value of the variable. And the right hand side is arbitrary expression. In some languages, uh, since uh, math e equal sign is easily uh, confused with the assignment, they use a different operator for assignment. Uh, some languages less than dash and so on. Uh, we have versions of that. One is uh, Assignments as expression. So assignment has a side effect of returning a value. So it updates the variable and returns the value. And we can use that value and propagate it to initialize, for example, multiple uh, values instantly. Or we have uh, parallel assignments. I believe in Python uh, courses, you have learned about that. So in the parallel assignments, we will have left hand side and so you will have so you can have a and b is assigned to x and y so left hand side the uh, l value can be also some aggregate of references aggregate of uh, values at the right hand side so iteratively, Python will assign each values one by one so that A and B will have those values. And interestingly, you can say this one, okay? So X and Y is going to exchange their values. Uh, so uh, the Python uses some uh, iteration-based syntax, so uh, different types of aggregations uh, are possible. Uh, but I'm not sure if this is going to work. Let's try it. Yeah, it worked, okay. Uh, so uh, this is, and also we have you all know this operator-based assignments as well. Uh, this is actually a powerful tool to assign uh, multiple variables uh, instantly. Uh, the next type of statements uh, are the procedure calls. Procedure call is actually uh, like a function, but it does not return a value, but has a side effect. In Fortran, they call it subroutine. In Pascal, they call it procedure. In C, we call it void function. So function returning nothing is actually a procedure. So its purpose is to have a side effect. And it is an abstraction over uh, the statement. So that means it is like user-defined statement. So when you write such a function in C, it is a user-defined statement. The syntax is parameters are like that and so on. We have block commands uh, here. Uh, you are going to hear some things that you don't know, uh, probably. And it is not a frequent case, but some languages have that. 
uh, in usually, in usual case, we need to group statements for uh, defining blocks, and they that those blocks have special meanings, uh, like defining new variables, creating new scope. But more importantly, they replace any statement position. That means in your language, if you define, for example, a loop gets a statement, instead of executing a single statement in the loop body, you can execute multiple statements in the loop body with this uh functionality in some languages they use different syntax for example in pascal it is uh, begin and in uh, fortran it is do something and some languages other languages also use do uh, the thing here is if you use them this way command one is executed then command two is executed then command three and command n so this is the thing you already know and this is called sequential composition of commands. The commands are sequentially executed. Also, we have a couple of different approaches. One approach could be instead of uh, sequence, uh, sequential commands, you can have a different punctuation. Please do not mind punctuation here. This comma is not C comma, it is just abstract definition. What if I give the programming language uh, freedom to execute them in any order. So this will be a block command, but programming language can execute C2 first, CN first, C1 first, I don't care. As long as they execute all of them, I'm okay with it. This is sometimes useful, especially when you need, for example, uh, optimization so that programming language can freely optimize your code. If you seek that, you can do this, and it is called collateral composition of commands. Uh, so, for example, if you have these two assignments, it can be collaterally composed. There is no problem. Either uh, set y to three or increment x. Which one is first doesn't, I don't care which was, but this one, it is important. So I shouldn't use collateral or sequential composition because it is going to give different values. So you will have this deterministic, uh, calc the calc result of calculation should be deterministic. It is a problem for us. Um, <clears throat> however, although this looks uh, a quite important thing for optimization, it is not because we have very smart optimizers. And even uh, if you don't optimize your code, nowadays our CPUs are too clever. Uh, they even execute some instructions uh, before uh, finishing the previous one. So they are like, doing some predictive execution, as such. So it is uh, not much necessary. But we have very important uh, concept, which is concurrency. Sometimes in some languages, you may need concurrency. That means execute them in parallel uh, or concurrently. It depends on uh, if you have a parallel uh, architecture, have, having multiple CPUs or not, execute them in parallel. And it is called concurrent composition of commands. So, for example, if you have 16 CPUs and you have uh, 16 addition operations, they are executed in instantly. So order will be also uh, uh, random or non-deterministic, but the idea is they are going to be executed in parallel. Uh, in some languages, we have that support. Uh, they are called concurrent languages. Uh, there are interesting languages in that case, but uh, usually a C, C++, Java, Python are not like that. You need class libraries to achieve that. At the end, you will get that uh, with some special functions, MapReduce functions and so on. But it is not uh, as simple as using just the punctuation. And this is an example of C. So these three functions are called in parallel with some external library. In Java, we have 
counterparts and so on. Okay, I believe, I believe you all know what the conditional command is. Uh, depending on the condition, you execute one of the alternatives. Uh, we have if else statements, and they can be nested as well. Or we have uh, switch based statements. Uh, the execution uh, jumps directly to the alternatives. Uh, in Python, for example, we don't have it. Uh, in C, we have restriction. This value needs to be an integer. And the reason of that uh, restriction is because uh, C compiler tries to make this efficient, directly jumping to the location. Mm -hmm. If that jump can be some arithmetic function or some table lookup, C does that in order to make it more uh, efficient. But if you have, for example, 50 different values, unrelated random values, C cannot do that. It turns out to be if then else. Uh, also, we have non deterministic conditions. Again, in uh, concurrent languages, we have that. So, these uh, condi uh, conditions here, like in if else or in the switch case, uh, the conditions are executed in parallel. Okay, so if you have, for example, ten different conditions, every each of them is uh, executed on a different CPU, and first one winning is killing the others. So that again, effectively, it is going to be uh, same with uh, the sequential uh, execution. But the uh, result is more efficient. And because of some, uh, assume two of the conditions are true at the same time, uh, one of them can win. There is no non determinism here. Also, here, these label checks are done in parallel and first one wins. Uh, interestingly, even though this uh, is a programming language concept implemented by concurrent languages, uh, this is actually how Intel processors works nowadays. And uh, what they do is they execute both branches parallel. And when one of the conditions uh, calculated as true, the others are rolled back. They are deleted. So if we go back to a state. And it is called branch prediction. So if you are a uh, Curious student, you can read about that. It is called branch prediction. And we had some security problems related to that as well. Okay. So if you interested, if you're interested, you can read it on your own. Uh, iterative statements. Uh, actually, this is what we call loops. And depending on different uh, classification, we have different statements. Instead of executing as just a single statement, that statement is repeated. And the interpretation depends on some uh, check uh, before uh, the loop body. So the check precedes the loop body. Or sometimes we have body is always executed and the check is done afterwards. So while and do while loops are like that. So it is at least uh, zero times versus at least once uh, iteration loops. Uh, in different languages, there are different names. For example, this is called repeatantive in Pascal. Uh, and we have four loops. And that four loops can be definite versus uh, indefinite. Uh, indefinite iteration, uh, the number of iterations of the loop is not known. So it is like while loops. You cannot know how many times the loop will iterate. C4 loops are also in different iteration loops. In the uh, different iteration, you can calculate the number of iterations when loops started. Pascal uh, does uh, such an interesting restriction, sometimes annoying restriction. So it is the for loop can all, only work with integers. This is first restriction. Second thing, you cannot change loop index in the body, so I cannot be modified. Uh, 
As a result, this becomes a definite iteration loop. It is going to be executed n minus k plus one times. Uh, the advantage of such uh, an implementation is actually uh, about uh, the processors and uh, instructions. Uh, they will be much more, not much more, but they will be more efficient. So we can do this uh, with very easy instructions. I can use a single register here. Uh, these uh, loop tests are fixed. I can put this one and this one into a register. So I can use only three registers to implement the loop and so on. Uh, other way of definite iterations is that does not have to be always definite, but uh, it is this uh, iterators of uh, script languages uh, are examples of that. So for each element of a data structure, I execute some code. That means instead of having some conditional, a Boolean value uh, to be evaluated, uh, or some integer comparison is done in order to exit the loop, I do just iteration over a data structure. And interestingly, you can uh, implement those iterators in some languages like Python as well. So as a result, you will have uh, that's interesting type of iterations. I can show you actually a couple of examples. Uh, Python loops are like that. Uh, for example, when you say for i in one, two, three, it's i, i times i, it is like that. Uh, also, uh, many data structures are like uh, iterators, so like A, 1, B, 2, C, 5. So this is a dictionary, however, it is also an iteratable uh, object. Uh, the sets are like that as well. So this is a set in the same uh, way. Uh, and in uh, Python, you can also implement this. Actually, what's going on is some uh, next function and so on. I can give you examples later. Uh, so even in the shell, we have these iterators. dollar i and this is just a simple iterator it is sometimes useful for example you can also use uh c echo dollar e. so it is going to show me all files matching c and so on so this is the definite iteration example Okay, so this is the end of uh, the storage. So in this chapter, we have learned about uh, how uh, storage of variables are organized, how we access them. We talk a little bit about arrays and uh, how they are updated and so on. We talk about uh, four uh, lifetimes, global lifetime, local heap, and persistent lifetime, uh, and how they are implemented in the program's memory. Uh, thank you very much for uh, listening. Uh, I will see you in other slides and other uh, recordings. Thank you. Bye-bye.